Hello, my name is Cynthia Alder, and I'm going to be discussing thyroid agents used in treating hypothyroidism. So essentially, we'll start with the thyroid gland. I'll introduce you to some of the pharmacological drug classes, the therapeutic class involved, talk a little bit about the pathophysiology and the goals of treatment. We'll discuss some nursing strategies and interventions in treating these patients, talk a little bit about cultural and alternative therapies, and then we'll discuss some research articles. So essentially, this is a thyroid gland. It's a butterfly-shaped gland sitting right below the larynx, and it produces these two hormones, T3, triidothyronine, and T4, thyroxine. It does this by uptaking iodine out of the bloodstream, mixing it with tyrosine, and then producing these two hormones. So T4 is uh, like the potential energy. It needs to be converted to T3 to actually be used by cells in the body. So once these two hormones are made, they, are, they bind with thyroxine binding globulin, and then they're transported to each cell. So these two hormones regulate metabolism throughout the cell. They're involved in oxygen and calor calories uh, entering into the cell. Uh, they regulate growth and development, and they're very important in reproduction and the nervous system. So essentially how this works is the hypothalamus releases thyroid releasing hormone that stimulates the pituitary, the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. And then that stimulates the thyroid to release these two hormones, T3 and T4. So for drug classifications, these uh, medications we're gonna be talking about are thyroid agents. That's broken down into antithyroid agents, which are used for treating hyperthyroidism when we have too much T3 and T4. And hypothyroidism is the drugs that we're gonna be discussing. These are thyroid hormones. So these fall under the therapeutic class of thyroid hormone replacements. So the four drugs are the levothyroxine, the lyothyronine, the lyotrix, and the thyroid desiccator. These are very safe drugs. They're in the category eight. They don't cross the placental barrier, and they're harmless to the unborn babies. So here's our drugs, thyroid hormone treatments. The first one, levothyroxine, is a synthetic form of T4. That's the potential energy. And um, this is the first drug that's given when we see signs of hypothyroidism because we want the body to try to convert the T4 into the active form T3 used for energy. But when that's not possible, this, the medication lyothyronine is given because the body can't, can't produce this T3. Um, so then these two medications also um, suppress the TSH levels because the body, in, when it senses those low levels of T3 and T4, it keeps producing more and more TSH. So Lyotrix is a synthetic form of T3 and T4, and that's in a ratio of four to one. When everything is working properly, the normal ratio of the body is four, is 20 T4s to each one T3. So more potential energy, essentially. Thyroid desiccated is dried animal thyroid glands, and it's both T3 and T4, and they're not in uh, any particular ratio. These medications are given because they're very inexpensive, and often they're given in third world countries where price is an issue. So some of the side effects of these medications are those associated with hyperthyroidism, when we have increased metabolism. Um, some of the drug-drug interactions, uh, very important uh, is the anticoagulants, most specifically warfarin. These can cause increased bleeding and should not be given with the anticoagulants. They also should not be given with the bile sequestrants, cholesterolamine and digitalis or digoxin. They can decrease uh, the levels of those in the body as well. Uh, some life-threatening contraindications are um, that can 
are things that can result are thyroid toxicosis. This is a thyroid crisis and can result in a complete shutdown of the body. And also a complete cardiac shutdown resulting in an MI. So the two drugs, lyothyronine and lyotrix, um, should not be given in patients that have cardiac issues because they can increase the, the side effects of cardiac problems. So getting back to the pathophysiology of hypothyroidism, this is a negative feedback loop mechanism when T3 and T4 are low, the hypothalamus senses that low level and then again produces a TRH acting on the anterior pituitary and then that stimulates TSH production acting on the thyroid. So when these two levels are low, the hypothalamus and they're not being produced, it starts shooting out increased levels of these two hormones, and that can be very damaging to the thyroid. It can uh, damage the thyroid tissue. So some of the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism that we're seeing is cardiovascularly, the heart slows down, the rate slows down, we have poor perfusion, patients are very intolerant to cold, um, they get decreased cognitive abilities, a mental fog. Um, the GI slows down. They're not absorbing nutrients. They get decreased motility and increased in constipation. Neuromuscularly, myosin is a gel-like substance that deposits under the skin and in joints and causes decreased activity. So they have kind of slow, slow sluggish um, gates. Uh, the myosin also deposits in the tongue and enlarges the tongue. So these patients are um, have a lot of things going on, need a lot of education. So some of the goals of treatment are essentially trying to normalize these levels with the medications. We want to increase the metabolic rates of the cardiovascular, GI, and neuromuscular function. And we want to provide comfort measures. Uh, because of the intolerance to cold, we want to make sure they're warm. They have um, GI uh, anti-constipation type medications. These patients need a lot of support and reinsurance. They need a lot of family support. Uh, they have so many things going wrong. They need lots of education. So some of the strategies and interventions for these patients are we want to start by getting a, an accurate and thorough assessment of all of their body systems and see where they're having the most problems. We'll look at their history, see if there's any family um, uh, diseases that might uh, cause hypothyroidism. We're going to make sure they're getting a, plenty of iodine in their diets, proper nutrition, because the the stomach is not able to absorb nutrients adequately. They're going to have to have their these three levels monitored frequently and re-monitored. They're going to have to understand this is a lifelong therapy. Uh, so the interventions in treating this basically um, are providing comfort measures. We want to make sure that they take their weight and and see if these medications are working. Uh, manage uh, some of the symptoms of constipation and uh, perhaps depression because these patients are often depressed. Some of the cultural considerations, generally hypothyroidism is found in white females, but for those that are non-English speaking, uh, they need a lot of guidance and understanding. They might need support systems, families being... Uh, assisted in helping them to understand uh, this disease, and they're gonna need a lot of care and planning. So those, those that are most at risk are white female. They found that um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is mostly uh, occurs in white female. So white females during menopause as well, men over the age of 60, and then 
those patients that have been treated for hyperthyroidism with radiation or surgery. So one of the autoimmune diseases, which is the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, is the number one reason that the people in developing countries get hypothyroidism. So some of the herbal alternatives uh, focus on some of the symptoms and also actually help the thyroid uptake iodine and produce these hormones. The ones used mostly for symptoms are um, the baco manere and then the sage. The sage also helps with sugar balance. can be a big problem for these patients. And then the coleus for all sky helps with body weight and depression. A lot of times these herbal alternatives are taking, taking um, several alternatives that are combined into one. So some of the research, uh, they were initially treating hypothyroidism and increased TSH levels, which is considered the subclinical hypothyroidism. So we have normalized T3 and T4, but elevated TSH. They were treating them with these medications, but they started doing research and discovering that it really wasn't improving their quality of life and really was having no effect, no effect on mortality or morbidity. So now they only are treating clinical hypothyroidism with these medications. Some of the uh, chemicals out there that are very detrimental to the thyroid are perichlorate. And it's found in fertilizers, explosives, batteries, and rocket fuel. And they were discovering that it was getting high levels um, leaching into the groundwater and getting into drinking water. So now there's extra efforts to make sure that to monitor this perichlorate in our drinking water. So they discovered that it's, it reduces thyroid hormones by uh, blocking the uptake of iodine. It causes serious effects for uh, thyroids and uh, hormone production. Uh, so they've done, done a studies on women that have increased levels of perichlorate and discovered that there's a great diminishment in brain function amongst their fetuses. Uh, so most specifically, they've done research showing um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, is increased in, in these um, babies that are born to these mothers. So this pretty much wraps it up. Um, I talked a little bit about the thyroid gland. I introduced you to some of the pharmacological drug classes. We talked about the pathophysiology some of the strategies, cultural and herbal alternatives, and some of the research evidence. So I hope this has been helpful to you, and thank you for listening.